dear God, our hearts are broken for this world. The hatred is palpable, the division undeniable, and the pain runs deep. We desperately need more of you. We ask for your truth to be louder than the noise which surrounds us. For your mercy to be stronger than the voices of oppression. For your strength to overpower those who seek to do harm. Where there is division, bring unity. Where there is anger, bring peace. Where there is evil, bring victory. Empower us to fulfill your mission, to answer your calling, to be the light you've created us to be. May your love, your grace, and your mercy flood this world. We love you. We seek you. We place our hope in the mighty name of Jesus. This we pray.
Come on, praise the Lord right where you are right now. Hallelujah. Woo, that's another one of those songs, man. Listen, at my core, I love preaching, I love teaching, but I've said it before. At my core, man, I'm a singer. And I love to sing more than anything. And that is one of those praise and worship songs that really gets you in the spirit and makes you just want to sing your heart out for the Lord. I mean, the harmonies on that song are amazing, especially by the group that performed it. Shout out to the Mississippi Mass Choir. Man, y'all y'all blew that up. I used to love when we sang that at our church. But y'all heard the song, man. The God we serve is excellent. And his name rings true in all the earth. And every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. Everybody, that's the goal all throughout the world. Amen. Listen, with that, we say thank you and we welcome you for joining us for our Tuesday night online services where, hey, as always, we give all glory to God for what he is doing through this, his global church body. And as we normally do, we want to start off by saying hello and welcome to our fellow saints, our friends, at our sister church, Oasis on the Mount Church and Healing Center in Garland, Texas, led by my brother, Pastor Chris Pipkin. Greetings, Oasis. So wonderful to have y'all with us here today. As you see, Oasis, we're continuing that theme that y'all started. I'm going to get to that in a second. Band enough familiar. But thank y'all so much, Oasis, for joining us. We encourage you out there. Get involved in everything that Oasis is doing because they're part of the Global Church Body Alliance. Now, again, for those that don't know, the Global Church Body Alliance is ourselves, Benevolent Faith, Oasis on the Bount, Life Ministries in India, and Amaribe Foundation Ministries in Kenya, and BMC Radio in Wales, UK. All of us together from the Global Church Body Alliance. Now, what is that? That's a whole bunch of churches coming together under one banner of unity in Christ. That don't mean that we're all becoming one church being in one building. It means that we all already have our own things going on, but we're focusing them around Christ and coming together under that ideology. That's what the Global Church Body Alliance is. And we're prayerful that God will expand it as we continue. So the theme of the Global Church Body Alliance for the rest of 2022, Abandon the Familiar. That's what we want to be doing. Shout out to Oasis. They started this entire campaign. And we encourage you to go out there and follow them on their Facebook page and their, um, uh, their website. And you'll see the links to both in the chat. We also want to say hello and welcome to our sister churches. As I said before, Life Ministries with Brother um, Pastor Shelton Ravi out of Andhra Pradesh, Southern India, and Amaribe Foundation Ministries with Pastor Peter Majeri out in Kinsey, Kenya. Welcome, and shout out to BMC Radio and uh, Pastor Nick, uh, Pastor Bromwell and uh, Evangelist Nick Brown. That's our family, y'all. That's the GCBA family. And so we welcome them and we thank them for joining us. And of course, we always thank you for joining us. And one of the best ways that you can help us out with our GCBA and with our Tuesday night online service, especially hit that invite button. Invite somebody to come out and worship with us this evening. And then tell them, listen, I know it's busy on Tuesday for you. I know that their start time, 7 Eastern, might be a little too early for you. So guess what? You can watch the replay of the service on Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. That's lunchtime for most people. Or you can just watch it on their Facebook page. Uh, watch it on their YouTube page, I should say, and they provide a link to it on their Facebook page. So there's a lot of different ways that you can watch the service, and you can let people know that. But, of course, the easiest one is to just have them hit that little old invite button. Amen? We appreciate that if you spread the word about our Tuesday night services. And at this time, we ask that you please direct your attention to the screen for this week's announcements. Make sure y'all go download our new mobile app, the Benevolent Faith Ministries mobile app is available in Apple and Android stores everywhere. You'll find all of our ministries in the app, including links to this online service, as well as links to our Wednesday afternoon TV show, 
our BMC radio shows, and our podcast every first Friday of the month. You can also request prayer, donate to our giving partners, and much more. Download the app today. Hey, friends. Check out an all-new episode of our TV show, Walk in the Word with Benevolent Faith Ministries. It airs every Wednesday afternoon at 2.30 p.m. Eastern, 1.30 p.m. Central, 11.30 a.m. Pacific Time on the Daily Gospel Network. Just go to www.dailygospelnetwork.tv and check us out. Friends, we're excited to be partnered with the best new faith-based radio station in the world, BMC Radio, where they're reaching the unreachable. Just go to www.bmcradio.net to listen live every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if you missed the live episode, you can still catch all the biggest shows on BMC Radio, including Benevolent Faith Ministries' own two shows, by going to the BMC On Demand page. Just go to bmcradio.net and click on the menu for more information. We have partnered with Open Doors USA to launch our Season of Prayer Campaign 2022, where we'll be focusing all of our efforts on praying for persecuted Christians all over the world, including our fellow saints in our sister churches in India and Africa. Please go download the free Open Doors USA app from the Apple or Android store today and pray along with us. You can download the free app by going to odusa.org backslash prayer. Join us every Thursday evening at 8 Eastern, 7 Central, 5 p.m. Pacific, beginning Thursday, April 21st, for our all-new interactive Bible study series entitled Abiding in the Vine. You'll be able to join the live chat, upvote questions, participate in polls, and call in directly to speak with the host of the session. Download the Bullhorn FM app from the Apple and Android stores today and search for the Abiding in the Vine Bible Study Podcast to join right now. Amen, amen, amen. Listen, we are very, very excited about the relaunch of our Bible study uh, series, our Bible study session called Abiding in the Vine. And we've got some great lesson plans lined up and we really encourage you Go to that Bullhorn FM app. Just go to the Apple or Android stores and search for Bullhorn. And look for that megaphone, the orange megaphone with Bullhorn underneath it. And download that app. And what you'll see when you go there is it'll it'll have us up there. And it'll say, oh, our show's coming on blank. And I'm telling you right now, it's going to be um, Thursday the, what day is that? Can't be the 17th. I might have said the 17th, but that would be wrong because me and my wife are going to be in Puerto Rico. But it's going to be in April. So if you go to the Bullhorn app and you look for Abiding in the Vine, you'll be able to sign up right now so that when we go live, it'll just alert you on your phone. We're really excited about this, y'all. Why? Because it's very interactive. As we do the Bible study, you're going to be able to call in and ask questions. You're going to be able to type in questions. It's going to be a live chat. We're going to have special guests. It's going to be crazy. And we encourage you to please become a part of our Bullhorn FM Bible study session. You're going to hear more about it coming up. But we encourage you, go download the app and get ready for it because it's coming, y'all. Amen. But tonight, tonight, my friends, our scripture passage is taken from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 10. And I'm going to be reading this from the New American Standard Bible Version. And the Lord's Word reads as follows. Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Tonight, my friends, as we continue to expand upon our theme of abandon the familiar, shout out to Oasis for the t-shirts. By the way, we're going to be making more t-shirts and we're going to be making them available to you out there. So stay tuned for that too. But as we expand upon this theme of abandoning the familiar, and particularly 
as we explored in the context of our new Global Church Body Alliance initiative and how we're trying to unify the body of Christ worldwide. Tonight, my friends, I want to speak from the subject, a house divided. A house divided. Let us pray. Father God, we just come to you, Lord, thanking you for another day, Father, another opportunity to get it right. Another chance to keep the main thing, the main thing. And Lord, we know that the main thing is preaching the gospel, letting people know about salvation through Christ, letting them know that they can have life away from the death that sin in the world offers. And so we thank you, Lord God, that not only have you made this available to us, that you've made us also partners in ministry with you to let other people know how important it is to seek and have this salvation. And so, Lord, as we come together, one collective body all over the world, we pray that the rest of the world will see this collective unity. In fact, we pray that those within the church community will become recommitted to this sense of unity so that once again, your house can get the type of glory that it did back in the days of Solomon and not be a house divided. O oh Lord, who makes all things new, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. You are our rock and redeemer, and we lift you on high, Father, so that the spirit of the living God can fall fresh and new this day. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Let your heart say amen, amen, and amen. A house divided. And y'all may have heard this phrase before, a house divided. You know, it's actually derived from the full statement, which is a house divided against itself cannot stand. And that's a statement that was made by our Lord and Savior himself, Jesus Christ. Now, when Jesus made that statement in Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, he was revealing how the world is sharply divided into God's kingdom and the devil's kingdom. Remember, we say it all the time. The choice is yours. You can get with this or you can get with that. And that's basically what Jesus was telling them. You got to get with one of them. <laughs> you, through his various arguments, he was indicating that you can't work for both kingdoms at the same time. One or the other. And that's the gist of the context that he was using when he said a house divided against itself cannot stand. Because see, the Pharisees, he had just ruled, uh, just healed a demon-possessed man. And the Pharisees, you know, they were haters of the optimist degree, of the optimal degree, the, the utmost degree. And so after he healed the demon-possessed man, instead of being awed and amazed like everybody else and praising God for this miracle, the Pharisees were like, he healing demons. Clearly, he must be from Beelzebub himself. So they was like, the only way he can heal demons is if he a demon himself. And that caused Jesus to have to rebuke them and be like, what's wrong with y'all? <laughs> if I'm Satan, how can I cast out Satan? That doesn't even make sense. That would make Satan divided against himself. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. So that's the background for that. That's why Jesus said that. And another time when that phrase was famously uttered was when Abraham Lincoln former U.S. president, said it when he accepted the Senate nomination at the Republican State Convention in Springfield, Illinois in 1958. And he was purposefully quoting Jesus when he did it, meaning he quoted Jesus on purpose. Now, this is just an aside because I know I'm a history buff and I love history. Did y'all know that when Lincoln said that, it was very controversial, okay, to make that type of comment and speak on the subject what that comment is about, which we'll get to in a second, right after he had just won the Senate nomination. They're like, dude, how are you going to ruffle these people's feathers? You just won the nomination. And all of that just, why did I bring that up, aside the fact that I'm a history buff? It just goes to show you that when you invoke the name of Christ and speak the truth about the Bible, you're going to have haters. You're going to have people who sense you or try to condemn you and say, you shouldn't say that. I'm just saying. But when Lincoln made that statement, he was talking about 
slavery. And he was talking about how the United States government was divided on the issue. And that led to a division within the country, which we know about three years later, 1861, led to the Civil War. But Lincoln's point was that in order, in order for the government, for the government officials to truly, for the nation to truly overcome that issue of being divided, members of the government had to be willing to come to the table for the good of the country with a greater emphasis on having a sense of unity that was born out of compromise. And so it's within that context that Lincoln used this phrase, a house divided against itself cannot stand. That's the context that we want to look at the phrase, a house divided, that is the subject of our text this evening. Because in our context, we're going to explore that same theme of division that Lincoln was talking about in the government, except we're going to be exploring division in the church. Saints of God, I'm pretty sure I ain't got to tell y'all how important it is to have unity in the church. Think about it. Anything that relies upon people to work together, it has to be grounded in a foundation of unity. If people ain't on the same page, they're not going to be unified. I mean, that's kind of a duh, duh kind of logic, isn't it? Furthermore, church unity isn't just limited to showing love to people inside that building. Meaning the church member experience shouldn't be exclusively relegated to just one place. Don't act like the church or think you're going to be the church only when you go up in that building. Because as we see throughout the New Testament, all local and visible gatherings of the church are considered expressions of the one invisible and universal church. And followers of Christ have always confessed the existence of only one universal church. In other words, that singular church building that you go to is part of a much larger global body of Christ. When we say body of Christ, we're not just talking about the people in that building. We talk about people in every church building everywhere all around the world. That's the body of Christ. And that's why we're the Global Church Body Alliance, because it's around the world. And the New Testament often describes the church as a unified body joined together through the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's why we unify. We unify because of the Lord. And when the church does that, it doesn't, or when the New Testament, excuse me, when the New Testament does that, it doesn't differentiate between churches in different cities or this church in this country and this church on that continent or even between churches with differing belief systems, this denomination or that denomination. Listen, just as there's only one Lord, there's also only one faith, one baptism, and one spirit unifying the faithful. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6 puts it like this. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. So all of that means that there's also only one church body in Christ. No matter how many different locations it may be in, there's only one body. In the Gospel of John, the Lord describes the church as, quote, one flock. You can see that in John chapter 10, verse 16. 
And Jesus even prays to the Father that the church, quote, may be one even as we are one. You see that in John chapter 17, verses 22 to 23. And of course, the book of Acts has all these illustrations of this loving unity amongst the church members. And it paints this portrait, this really inspiring portrait of the early church united in worship, united in service, and even holding goods in common. All of which you can read about in Acts chapter 4, verse 32. And we see that the early church conducted what's really the first documented instance of a social welfare program. Think about it. Because the people shared all they had with the people who had nothing. So everybody had something. Nobody lacked. Okay, you can read about that in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. So scripture clearly provides the model for us to craft ourselves into the image of what God considers his unified body. And a unified body is exactly what Paul was endorsing when he wrote this passage of text to the church in Corinth. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.10, the passage of, that's our subject passage today. See, Paul begins this letter to the Corinthian church with thanksgiving. Hey, how y'all doing? I'm glad to see y'all. Hope everybody's in good health. But then by verse 10, he jumps right into it. Yeah, yeah, now all that's over with. Let's get to the real issue. I hear that y'all got some stuff going on, and I'm writing to address it. Essentially, he was offering a plea for unity in the church. So not only does he make this plea, but then he makes it even more authoritative. He puts even more stress on it, the seriousness of it, by asking the church to embrace that sense of unity in the name of Jesus. Now that shows you the sense of urgency in his appeal as well. Now, why do I say that? That there was a sense of urgency? Because he was saying, listen, we're all a part of this group, this membership, this fellowship together, because we all believe that this man was the Messiah and was God in the flesh. Okay? So I'm appealing to y'all in his name, in the very name of the person that we claim we all here for. I'm appealing to y'all Stop doing what you're doing. Stop being trifling. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> That's basically what he was telling them. And so the reason why he was telling them that was because Paul had gotten some bad reports about what was going down in the church in Corinth. And if you read 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, it was some wild stuff going on. As a matter of fact, they had to he told him to kick one member out because he was sleeping with his wife, uh, with his husband's wife or dad's wife or something. It was trifling. It was soap operas. Okay. It was on some old all about children type stuff up in the church. So Paul's getting all these bad reports. And specifically, he hears that the believers in the Corinthian church were showing loyalty to different leaders in the church and fighting among themselves because of it. Now, we don't know why they were dividing themselves like that, because the text doesn't tell us. All we know from verse 11 is that there were quarrels among the people in the church over which leader they wanted to follow. They were fighting over that. And that's what prompts Paul to make this appeal, to make this earnest request for unification in the church. Because see, as Paul knew, and I hope we know too, a lack of unity in the church can be damaging to the image and the mission of the church. I mean, just look at our own government for crying out loud. You'll almost never have unity in the American government through members of Congress. They'll never be unified. Members of the Senate. They'll never be unified. Why? Because there's a long history of bipartisan politics and a long history of people on both sides hating each other. You ever notice how the government, a bill will come up and then all the Democrats or all the Republicans will vote against it? 
It ain't that they disagree with the bill. It's that they try to be hard-headed because they don't want to agree with their enemies. That's how our government operates. And that's what Paul was trying to prevent from happening in the church. So to combat this sense of division that was taking place, he asks the Corinthian church to do three specific things. Uh, three specific things. And we're going to explore these three things, just three, and I'm going to be done, y'all. He asks them to do three specific things which would better promote unity and avoid that church becoming a house divided. And the three things he asked for them to do and become were to be, number one, a church unified in speech, number two, a church unified in identity, and number three, a church unified in purpose. So Paul asked them, yo, I need y'all to get unified in speech, unified in your identity, and unified in your purpose. So first, we see him asking them to be unified in speech. It's in right in the text. Paul asked that they, quote, all agree with one another in what they say. And the Greek derivative words, which make up the phrase all agree, literally mean, quote, each one that is himself or herself, to say, to speak, to affirm, to teach, to exhort, to point out with words. In other words, Paul's telling them to be agreeable in the manner and content of how they communicate. Y'all like, what? Listen, he's not asking them to be robots, okay? He's not telling everybody to parrot the same things over and over. You say what he say. She say what she say. He's not saying that. He's not telling them to copy what they say to each other or telling people to mimic words or phrases. He's not telling them that. In this context, y'all, what he's saying is that if they're going to call themselves followers of Christ and believers, then they should all collectively show consistency in what comes out of their mouths from a content standpoint. In other words, he's saying that half y'all shouldn't be cussing and half y'all with righteous speech and y'all call yourself one body. Them two things don't go together. There's no unity in that because half y'all doing your own thing. How you got half the church doing their own thug thizzle and then y'all say, we're a unified body of Christ? No, y'all not. You can't have people doing something over here that, do it, that doesn't correspond to what everyone else is also doing. In other words, he's saying that the only things that should be coming out of people's mouths should be things that glorify God and not things that tear other people down. And when you say things that tear other people down, what does it do? It leads to division in the church. So he's like, listen, you ain't got nothing good to say that's going to build people up. Shut up. That's how the church should operate. Because otherwise, we don't want to hear from you. Especially if it's something negative. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, confirms this. It confirms how powerful words are. Look what it says, Proverbs 18, 21. The tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. Huh. You know what they're saying? Keep running your mouth. You're going to get yours. God is promising you that. Remember when y'all was growing up? As a kid, remember how your parents would tell you, if you can't say anything nice about someone, don't say anything at all. First of all, I doubt many people's parents sounded like that, but you know, we got to make fun of parents yeah, using that condescending voice. But you'll know what I'm saying. Your parents said that all the time. So whether it's the temptation to say something nasty during an argument with your spouse or your significant other, or the temptation to say something nasty to that coworker that is consistently getting on your last nerve. Our inability to hold our tongues 
when we know, I shouldn't say that. That's a difficult thing for a lot of people. Check out this quote from Dr. Yasir Khadi, who's a Pakistani preacher, former college dean, and professor in Houston, Texas. Look at what he said. The tongue is but a small, soft flesh. Yet it is capable of breaking the strongest bonds and destroying the most powerful of relationships. Mm, ain't that true? And so as a result of that, believers are tasked with living up to the biblical standard for what comes out of our mouths, y'all. Especially when it comes to speaking to or about our fellow believers. And that's what Paul is saying here to the church in Corinth. That their speech should all reflect the fact that they follow a risen Savior and therefore they comport themselves as much, meaning they act like it, especially towards each other, especially in what they say and how they talk to each other and what they say and how they talk to the rest of the world who looks at the church and gets its image of the church from the people who go to the church. That's what he was saying. And he also made that point clear to the church at Ephesus. Look at what he said to them. Ephesus, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. You know what they're saying? It's saying unless what you, unless the next word that you're about to say is going to build up people, then don't say it. Because if what you're about to say is going to tear people down or otherwise cause negativity, then you can keep that to yourself because the church don't need it. That's what he was saying. And Paul also told the church at Colossae, the Colossians, Look at what he told them in chapter 4, verse 6, quote, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. You ever had some really bland food that didn't have no salt on it? You're like, yeah, it's all right. That's cool. Now put some salt on that joint. You'd be like, ooh, it, perkins, it perks it up. It livens up the flavor. Paul is saying to the church, to the Colossians, yo, when you talk to people, Season your speech with salt. Make it more flavorful. Make it to where it's going to appeal to them more. If you talk to them in a negative way, it ain't going to appeal to nobody. Because remember, the whole point you're trying to appeal to them is so that you can introduce them to the Lord. As Regine Hunter says, you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar. If you don't know who Regine Hunter is, go look her up. So anyway... The advice that we received, y'all, in those verses, uh, Colossians 4, 6 and Ephesians 4, 29, that advice should frame the purpose and goal of every word that we speak without exception, especially as we operate within the church. And especially since the word already told us there's going to be an accounting for every word that comes out your mouth. You might want to watch what you say. If God is watching what you say, and he's going to remind you later, remember when you said this? Remember when you said this? Yeah, you might want to watch what you say. I'm just saying. We only need to speak if we're going to be building up other people. And as we do, that allows our speech to be gracious and attractive, seasoned with salt. That's what that means. And that only further the building up of others and leads to the overall unification of the church, of the body of Christ. Because that, y'all, is the type of speech that demonstrates true unity and the type of speech that prevents the church from being a house divided. So we've seen Paul asking the church to be a church unified in speech. Next, Paul asks the church to be a church unified in identity. A church unified in identity. Again, we're right out of the text. 
Paul says, quote, that there be no divisions among you. He's asking them not to let there be divisions, not to let there be factions created among them. You know what's so crazy about that? Ain't it crazy that that's like the calling card of humanity, y'all? Going all the way back to the days of the ancients. People always want to click up in little groups based on the type of people that they can identify with. Don't miss that because we're going to come back to it. People click up based on the fact that they can identify with other people in that little click. Period. That's been an earmark of humanity from the beginning. It still happens today. We're reading about it happening right now, 2,000 years ago. And the history of the church, quite honestly, is inundated with instances of fragmentation and division in the church. We see in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse, or chapter 2, verse 1, Peter promised that, quote, false teachers would, quote, secretly bring in destructive heresies. That's, that's division. People coming into the church preaching a gospel that's not the gospel of Christ. And this idea was a, clearly a problem in Rome as well. Look at what Paul told the church in Rome. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Watch out for people who cause divisions and upset people's faith by teaching things contrary to what you have been taught. Stay away from them. Division in the church. And Paul further expressed his disdain for div divisiveness in the church in his letter to Titus. Look at Titus chapter 3, verses of 10 and 11. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. So we see that division was a problem in the early church, and that's exactly what we see happening in the text here at Corinth. Because like we said, the church congregation in Corinth was divided into cliques. They split following different leaders. Some of them wanted to follow Paul. Some of them wanted to follow a guy named Apollos. And some of them wanted to follow Peter. And you can see that in some of the texts it says Cephas. Uh, Cephas is the Greek word for Peter. And Paul addresses this, all of this. He addresses all of this in 1 Corinthians Chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. Like, what y'all following uh, everybody for? <laughs> and as he does, he said, what y'all following men for not following Christ? He rebukes them harshly for doing this, for trying to divide itself, for the church trying to divide itself by following different leaders. And he basically tells them, he makes a good point by telling them, what y'all following us for? Was I, was Paul crucified for you? Did, were you baptized in Paul's name? Of course not. So stop focusing on following behind men and put all your focus back on following Jesus. That's what he was telling them. And he tells these believers point blank that they ought to be in one mind and thought in Christ. They ought to be in one mind and thought in Christ. And again, I just think it's hilarious how humanity has not evolved at all, given the fact that the problem in the church 2,000 years ago is the same problem we have right now. The Corinthian church had formed cliques, just like people do in the church today. Do we not see that happening in the church today? If you don't, praise God for your church. Not being clicky. But most churches, they're seeing this happen. And a click back then and today basically consists of people who group themselves with other folks who share their views. And then those groups end up beefing with other groups or cliques that disagree with them. And that's how it works. And then nothing ever gets done in the church because this clique don't want what this clique want. And this clique got this power over this, 
So they withhold it from that clique in the church. Craziness. Y'all can imagine how frustrated Paul would have been over all this, right? I mean, think about it. This was his baby. This was the church he founded. And then he leaves, and it's in good hands. It's in a good state. He's like, I leave y'all in a good state. Holla at you. And he leaves to go plant other churches and do the same thing in other places. And then he gets word later, like, yo, that church you planted in Corinth, they tripping, boy. I'm sure that distressed him to a great degree. That was his church. So I'm sure what stressed him even more, though, was the fact that some of those same people in the church were claiming to follow him instead of focusing on the Lord. I know that really upset him. Like, didn't I teach y'all better than that? What did I leave y'all with? Friends, by these church members wanting to follow so many different leaders, the church was showing that it didn't have a true identity. Remember, we said earlier, we'd get back to this, the idea of having identity. We said earlier how people click up because they can identify with the other people within that group or clique. They were doing it back then in Paul's day, and they're still doing it in the church today. People separating over personal preferences, but claiming to follow God as they do it. That ain't godly. Friends, this is unacceptable behavior in the sight of God because it's not from God. Unity is a creation of God. Division is a corruption by man of that creation of unity. Don't miss that. Unity was created by God for all of us to be together. That's the whole purpose in Christ and him sending Christ. So by contrast, division is the opposite. Mankind circumventing that and corrupting it for his own purposes. Because wherever you have unity, God will be there, period. Because where there's unity, there's love, and God is love. Duh. But you'll never, and I mean never, find God chilling someplace where there's division and disharmony. Because that ain't what God is about. So he ain't going to hang around that stuff. God is perfect and holy. He can't be around sin. He's like allergic to it. That's why a unified church knows its identity. And that's that it's steeped in Christ and what he did on the cross. That's the identity of the church. And a unified church, a church that's unified in its identity, its members can readily identify with each other because of what they share in common. What we just said, a faith in Christ, a belief in salvation through him, and an obedience to the word of God. Their identity is tied to those things. And it's tied to the church being on one accord with respect to who those people are in Christ. And anything other than that falls outside of the scope of being a house, house that honors God. When the entire church is on one accord, y'all, the church is much more efficiently and effectively able to define its identity. Listen, y'all, as we abandon the familiar ways of doing and being a church, we should commit ourselves to never accepting division within the body of Christ. Because if we, as the bride of Christ, remember, that's what we are. We're the bride of Christ. If we, as the bride of Christ, don't prevent division in the church, then the marriage is in serious trouble. You feel what I'm saying? It's our job to ensure the body of Christ doesn't become a house divided. So we got to maintain unity. We got to maintain peace. I mean, if there can't be peace in the house of God amongst his people, 
where can there be peace? I'm just saying. So, we've seen Paul asking the church to be a church unified in speech and to be a church unified in identity. Last one and I'm done, y'all. We see Paul asking the church to be a church unified in purpose. A church unified in purpose. Paul asked them that they all be, quote, perfectly joined together in the same mind and judgment of things concerning the faith. He's asking that they be united in the same understanding or mind and the same conviction or their thoughts. In other words, he's asking them to be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. That's a unified church and purpose. A church that's unified in purpose. So, but how do we get there? How does the body of Christ go about ensuring that we are united in purpose? How do you get believers around the world to become united, especially when you have different cultures and different denominations guiding their faith? How do you do it? Because remember, when we talk about the church, we here at Benevolent Faith Ministries as part of the Global Church Body Alliance or the GCBA, when we talk about the church, we're talking about the global body of church. That's believers everywhere. Imagine every single Christian in the world going to one building. Think of it like that. Instead of thinking about all the different buildings trying to be one church, think of the biggest building in the world housing every Christian in the world. Because it's like, I think, two billion or something Christians in the world. It's got to be a pretty big building to house us all. Okay? But that's how I want you to consider the global church body. So how do we become united in purpose? Well, there's two very specific ways that the entire world of believers can all get on the same page, y'all. And the first way is a collective dependence upon God. We all got to depend upon him together. That means that everybody got to depend upon him in the same manner. That means we all got to get our lean on me. We all got to lean on him the same way way. Remember that promise that Jesus made back in the gospel of Matthew chapter 16 verse 18? Remember what he said? Upon this rock I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Y'all that's Jesus making that promise. That ain't your friend from down the street. That ain't the mailman. That ain't the dude who works to drive through at Arby's. That's Jesus. Meaning the church is his responsibility. It's not ours. It's up to him what the purpose of the church is. Don't have these pastors like, well, our, the purpose of our church is to do this and that. No, it ain't. The purpose of the church is whatever Jesus assigned for the church. And don't forget it. And don't let pastors tell you different. It's not his church. It's Jesus' church. Y'all, all we have to do as the body collectively, is walk in love, practice forgiveness, and obey him in all things and glorify him within the church body. That's the job of the global church body. That's all we got to do. Because you're like, well, how can we all be unified in purpose? If we all do those things, each one of us individually, then collectively we'll be carrying it out. Now, won't we? Because if we all do that, then Jesus will see to it that his church survives the battles and remains a blessing in the world. Why would you save something that's not worth saving? Why would Jesus not bring your church through the battles if your church ain't worth saving? Maybe Jesus wants your church to close because it don't represent God properly. You ever thought about that? All the churches that closed during the pandemic, a lot of them shut down because financially they couldn't make it anymore. All I'm saying is maybe God shut some of them down because of this very reason. Because they weren't worth saving. Because by the same token, it's a lot of churches that are thriving right now, despite the pandemic. So explain that. I'm just saying, food for thought. Saints of God, the whole point of Paul's letter to the Corinthians is to tell them that it's Jesus and not us. 
that has to be the centerpiece of everything that the church does. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction, but we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. God got to be about everything. Christ has to be about everything that the church is about. In all things, above all things, and before all things. Jesus Christ, his will, his glory, and his person must be first and foremost in every church everywhere. That's the starting point. Because keeping that focus is how these churches stay united in purpose. It ain't about the preacher, it ain't about the deacons, it ain't about who gave land for the church, it ain't about whose family laid the cornerstone to the foundation of the church building. Don't nobody care about none of that. Because it ain't about that. It is about Jesus. Period. As long as Jesus remains the apple of the church's eye, then the church going to win, 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 no matter what. A church that's united in purpose knows that its members have to see the church as much more than just a place that satisfies my needs, a place where I come for my enjoyment, a place where I come for my own edification and spiritual enlightenment. You know what's wrong with everything I just said? Because y'all like, what's wrong with that? Everything I just said, there's too many mys in that. My enjoyment, my needs, my edification. There's too much my in that. Church got to be about Jesus and just Jesus. Y'all know that old saying, there's no I in church, but you are. Get it? There's no I in church, but you are. Okay, so I made that up. It's not an old phrase. But y'all understand what I'm saying, right? Because that implies unity. Why? Because if you are in the church, then I are in the church too. And we're unified. I'm just saying. I told y'all I made that up. Remember, y'all, Jesus told us that wherever two or three are gathered in his name, that he'd be there in the midst. You can see that in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. So if that's the case, and we have every reason to believe that it is, and no reason to believe that it's not, then we need to recognize his presence and give him the preeminence that he demands and deserves in our churches. Because true victory for the church will only be found in Jesus and Jesus alone. Last thing and I'm done, y'all. For a church to be united in purpose, its members each have to commit to being in a deepening relationship with God. Yo, you ever really, really start liking somebody? And what's the first thing that happens when you really like somebody? You want to spend all your time with them, as much time as you can. That's a deepening of that relationship. That's the type of relationship, y'all, that God wants from us. He wants us to be like, I want to spend all my time with him. I love him so much. Same way you would that earthly relationship. He wants that relationship with you. With, from, he wants that relationship with every person that makes up membership in his house. So again, how do we all collectively deepen our relationship with God? Y'all, there's only two ways to do it. The first is prayer. As a church, our prayer lives have to be rich and regular. We need to bathe our churches in prayer. We need to be immersed in prayer in every respect. And our ministries, our churches and our ministries need to be bathed in prayer. Remember, Scripture tells us that God moves in response to the cries of his children. Look at James chapter 5, verse 16. The prayers of the righteous availeth much. You know what that means? That means when you obey God, listen to him, and you pray, nine times out of ten, ten times out of ten, he going to answer that prayer the way you want him to. That's what that means. So the first is prayer. 
That's how we all collectively deepen our relationship with the Lord, through prayer. Here's the last one. The word of God. Studying it, getting into it. Period, point blank, y'all. The Bible is our source of strength for this day-to-day -day battle that we call being believers. And a church united in purpose is a church that puts a heavy premium on reading, studying, and meditating on the Word of God. It's a church which can, quote, study to show itself approved, as we see in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Friends, there are way too many people who have been led into error and into sin and false doctrine simply because they weren't grounded in the Word of God. They didn't know the Word for themselves, so they believed somebody else, and that person led them into sin. And sometimes it's at the church that they go to that this happens. When churches fail to feed themselves on this blessed holy book, when they don't feed themselves on that, they get malnourished and they end up weak and anemic because they're not being fed by the proper sources. Think about it. You're going to be weak and anemic versus strong and vibrant if you eat nothing but fast food as opposed to eating fruits and vegetables. you got to put the right things in your body. The church has to put the right things in its spirit. People get easily led astray and become prime targets for attacks of the devil whenever they fail to let the Bible guide their lives. So the church has to be grounded in the Word of God. Not in the opinions of preachers or other men. Not in their ideas. Only the pure, unfiltered, unadulterated, unaltered word of the living God. That's it. And as the church in Corinth demonstrates to us, y'all, when you follow the lead of men and ignore the word of God, you can assure yourself that that house God's house will end up being a house divided. So as I close this evening, my friends, the goal of the Global Church Body Alliance is to see every church come together under the same banner of unity in Christ. And it sounds like a lofty goal, but then you, all you got to remember is that it's not a goal that's being carried out in human power. This is all God's doing. This is God guiding this. It was his vision, his plan. That being the case, why would it fail if he's the one behind it? And as we've read, God continues to and will continue to have his guiding hand on the church. He's got his hand on ours. Thank you, Lord. So we have no reason to, not to believe that he don't have his hand on other churches too right now. We just got to do our part in the experience, y'all. And that means showing unity with others. That's what the Global Church Body Alliance is all about. You know what's really sad, y'all? What's really sad is the fact that any one of us, anybody within the body of Christ, is only one step away from being the spark that the devil uses to blow the whole church up. Because anybody watching this right now who refuses to walk in humble submission to the Lord is capable of being used by the enemy to destroy the church's fellowship. The type of fellowship that we at Benevolent Faith Ministries and the GCBA, the type of fellowship that we promote on our platform and through our initiative. Say to God, don't let it be you that Satan allows to be the spark. God challenges you to search your heart and find that place that propels you to keep your dependence upon him and upon prayer and upon his word. Because those are the things that lead to increased unity in our churches and not to the church being a house divided. Amen? But listen, you can't know nothing about unity in the house unless you're part of the house. 
And in order to be part of the house, you have to accept the one who built the house. And that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So here's your chance. Is there one? This is your opportunity to come to the Lord right now. Ain't you tired of being part of something divisive? Don't you want unity in your life? Christ is a unifier. Satan is a divider. Christ is a unifier. When you accept him, you accept unity and therefore peace in your life. Don't you want that? Why don't you come to Jesus today? Is there one? Won't you come? Hallelujah. 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 We always applaud at this time because we know that the seeds have been planted and that somebody out there heard this message like, hmm, maybe I will go to church next week. That's all we're asking, y'all. Take the Lord more seriously, especially in these last days when stuff's getting crazier and crazier. The closer you can get to the Lord, the better. And if we can be a platform that facilitates that, then hallelujah. And that's what we're going to do until he comes back to get us all. Amen. Hey, and with that, it's time for giving. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Why? Because the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Listen, when we give, to the things of the kingdom of God, it's best that we do cheerfully because why would God want something from us that we give him begrudgingly? Have you ever given something to someone and they like really didn't appreciate it? And in your mind, you're thinking, I didn't have to give that to you in the first place. Well, you know, God is kind of the same way. So it's like, why are we not paying homage to the one true God of the universe? with all of our time and with our money if we're going to call ourselves following his son. So that's why it's important that we believe that, we take ministry, that giving is a big part of everyone's ministry. And as you know, Benevolent Faith Ministries is not like most churches in that we do not have your traditional tithes and offering model. Okay, We have what instead are called giving partnerships. What is that? Click on the link you see right now that says give. It's going to take you to our website that's going to explain to you what our giving partnerships are, which is essentially what we have done is partnered with organizations all around the world that are already doing the work of the board, wherever they are. Prison Fellowship, Pat International, the American Cancer Society, on and on and on. Also, our funding also goes to help our sister churches in both Kinsey, Kenya, and uh, Andhra Pradesh, Southern India, with all the endeavors that they've got going on. Listen, giving is a mandatory part of every follower of Christ, and we encourage you to get involved if you call yourself being a follower of the one true most high Lord and Savior. Then giving of your time and of your money is something that we're required to do. It's not something that's suggested of us. So that ain't coming from Ben Rob. That's coming from the heaven above. Amen? With that, a service, my friends. We appreciate y'all joining us. Prepare your hearts to receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and grant you peace. May the grace of God, which is manifested in blood shed by his son Jesus, guide you in all truth so that you may be fully equipped and able to represent his kingdom properly all over the globe. Hey, in Jesus' name we pray. And every heart say amen, amen, and amen. Hey, thank y'all so much. Remember, chat stays open for three minutes afterwards. Stay in chat with us and talk about the Lord. Amen. God bless.